Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your revelation. I thank you for your confirmation. And I thank you, Lord, that you are now ready to reintroduce the Holy Spirit to this present generation. I thank you, Father, that you have given us your word by which we come to understand the deeper truths over which we have become stewards. I thank you, Father, for a church that has an ear to hear. I thank you, Father, for giving me the ability to speak. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to communicate heavenly truths. And I believe, Lord, that you are stirring something in our day even now, that the Holy Spirit himself is making a reintroduction. And we thank you, Father, for this. Lift your hands all across this room. Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I adore you. Father, I'm so sorry for anything you've been working with me in. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your mercy. I adore you. I love you. Church, he's looking at you right now. Lift your hands. His eyes are on you. He's watching you this very moment. He can hear every word that comes from your mouth. His attention is on you. Just begin to lift your voices all across this room and just let him know how much you love him. Let him know how much you adore him. Jesus, you are the object of our affection. You are the pursuit of our passion. Lord Jesus, you are the all in all. You are everything we need and more. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would reveal Jesus to us in a fresh, tangible, intense, magnificent way. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. And we promise to welcome him. We promise to obey him. We promise not to grieve him. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I remember the first time that I met the person of the Holy Spirit. I had given my life to Jesus when I was 11 years old, and I was coming out of a very severe battle with depression and anxiety. I had it for, um, since I could remember, I think the first time I I remember having something, uh, somewhat of a panic attack was when I was seven years old. Seven years old, I had just this cloud over me, this heaviness, this fear, this anxiety, And over time, this developed into a stronghold that really took a strong root in my life. And I remember everything I did for God, and I put that in air quotes, everything that I did in the ministry, everything that I did out of religious expression and ritual, I did out of fear instead of love. And it birthed birthed religion. It did not birth a passionate relationship with God. You know, that's what a ritual is. It's spiritual minus spirit. It's just ritual. And so I was going through those motions. I was going through just the monotony of church service and ministry and uh, committing scripture to memorization. And certainly there was some power in that. And I was getting to know the truths of the Holy Spirit. I was getting to know the truths of scripture. But it wasn't until I gave my heart to Jesus that all of that heaviness was just broken and replaced with this ecstasy, this joy, this peace, this love, this serenity. Every weakness that I had was then strengthened by God. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm actually meeting Jesus. I'm actually meeting the one who in scripture walked around and touched the sick and they got out of their sickness, who, who would just with one word speak freedom to demonic Uh, demonically oppressed people, just one word, and they would be set free completely just in an instant. There was no back and forth, what's your name, how did you get in, how old was he when you got in, what's your favorite color? He just gave a word and cast the demon out. And this person who I knew historically, this person who I knew philosophically, this person who I knew socially, I now came into contact with personally, and it transformed my life. 
But it wasn't until two or three years later that I experienced something that I didn't know was available to me. It was something more. It was something beyond my salvation. Yes, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate experience than salvation. I'll give you just one example. The scripture says that when the disciples were before Jesus, before he ascended, what did he do? He breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus breathes on you and tells you to receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. He is the baptizer. He's the one to whom heaven has bestowed the authority to baptize people with the fire and the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus breathes on his disciples, says, receive the Holy Ghost, yet these are the very same who had to wait until Acts chapter 2 to be baptized. The scripture says that if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you are not a child of God. Yet Luke tells us that if we children ask our Father to give us the Holy Spirit, He will not give us stone, but He will give us a piece of bread. He will give us that which for we request. He will give us what we ask. But wait a minute. If I need the Holy Spirit to be a child, how can I then as a child ask for the Holy Spirit? It seems to be a catch-22 until you realize that the reception of the Holy Spirit is different than Him indwelling in you at the beginning of salvation. We look at Paul the Apostle, who was originally Saul. He's on his way to murder Christians, on his way to destroy the church, on his way to martyr people for preaching the way, preaching Jesus. And Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus. He's knocked off his horse. He experiences the glory of God. He, he, he says, who are you, Lord? I love that he didn't know who he was, but Jesus carried such authority that even though he didn't know who he was, he says, who are you, Lord? He carried that weightiness of the glory, that authority of heaven rested on Jesus' shoulders. And so Jesus touches Paul's life. He's now Paul. Then Ananias has a dream. God says, uh, Paul, or Saul, who is now Paul, is coming to you. And he scales on his eyes, so he gives him the whole rundown. He comes before the prophet. And Ananias introduces himself, and he greets Saul at the time by saying, Brother Saul. So if Saul was a brother, then he was a child of God. If he was a child of God, then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yet verses later, Ananias lays hands on him to receive his sight and tells him to receive the Holy Ghost. So I don't want to delve too much into the study of why it's a separate experience. I just wanted to sort of survey that idea because I want to talk more about this person, why would anyone not want to receive all that Christ died to give you? If Jesus was willing to die to give it to me, who am I to reject it? Remember, Jesus says, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and blessed is the one who's not offended on this account, or by me, because of these things. Blessed is the one who's not offended at the supernatural nature of Christ. Miracles, we treat them like they're a liability in many churches when they are at the very cornerstone of the Christian faith. Salvation is a miracle. Communication with God is a miracle. The atonement is a miracle. Healing is a miracle. Deliverance is a miracle. The transformation of the heart is a miracle. It is all miraculous. It is all supernatural. And so I had yet to experience this experience. And many of you know the story. I've told it before that I went before God in my room. And this is after months of seeking. I mean, it was the ebb and flow of seeking God. You know what I mean? There are times when you hit the well and you live in that for weeks and then God withdraws himself and you think, what did I do wrong? God, did I make you mad? Uh, where are you, Lord? What am I missing? And really, when God withdraws himself, he's not doing it to get away. He's doing it to pull you closer, to pull you deeper. And so there, he gives you a little taste and then you hunger for more and then he pulls and you're like, okay, I'm following Lord. And he's pulling you gradually from glory to 
glory. Glory is the person of God. Glory is not a substance. It is his identity. And so we move from glory to glory. We move from depths to depths. We move within God. We are one in him. And the further he pulls us in, the more like Enoch, we disappear. And Enoch was not for God took him. Why? Because he walked with God so closely. God, that we would be ones who walk with you so closely that we are not. And this experience, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, I remember after this ebb and flow that I'm talking about, this back and forth of I experience God, and then he withdraws. I experience God, then he withdraws. I experience God, then he withdraws. Because he wants to be sought. That's in his nature. He invites us to do the seeking. That I I was so filled with passion. I feel like I reached the peak of my passion at that point. And I had this spiritual resolution, this concrete, solidified idea in my mind. I am going to experience all that you have for me if it kills me. And I remember... I, I think I was around 12, 13 years old. Just turned 13, just the first few months of being 13. I remember the words of Jesus, and I was inspired when he said, when you pray, just go lock yourself up. Go and be alone. Go and find a quiet place. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I shut my door. I locked it. I walked into my room, and the atmosphere at that point was as ordinary as it could be. And I said, Lord, I am not leaving from this spot until I experience something from you. You know, faith and persistence are synonymous in Scripture. Remember the woman who came to Jesus and said, Lord, heal my daughter? He says, I don't give bread to the dogs. And she persisted and said, Lord, but even dogs can eat crumbs from the table. And he says, I've not seen such faith. The persistence is equated with faith. And I said, Lord, I'm not moving from this spot until you touch my life, until I'm one with you. I don't don't care about my dreams. So many times we preach about your dreams, your dreams. The church is all fixated on your dreams nowadays. It's not about our dreams. It's about God's will. It's not about self-improvement. It's about self-abandonment. And I said, Lord, I'm not leaving from this spot until you strip everything that is not of you. I want to be one with you. And I remember I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, I want my hands to be your hands. Heal through them. I want my mouth to be your mouth. Let it be your mouthpiece. Prophesy. Speak life. Speak creative power. Use it like my tongue on fire, I prayed. I said, Lord, let my eyes be your eyes. I want to see things, people, and situations the way you see them. Lord, let my ears be your ears. I want to hear your voice. God, let my being be your being. Let my will be your will. Let my heart be as one with yours. Crucify my flesh. No longer I live, but Christ lives in me. This was a spirit-inspired prayer. And I remember I prayed that prayer, and then I got to work. You know, I, I did what I knew to do. The first thing I reached for was the melancholy emotions. You know, where we try to guilt God into a response. Lord, can't you hear me? God, are you there? Lord, have you abandoned me? It's the flesh working. The scripture says that the flesh profits nothing. That prayer is by the spirit. Worship is by the spirit. Connection with God is by the spirit. You know why it's by the Spirit? Worship is only by the Spirit because true worship only comes from revelation. And revelation can only come by the Spirit. True prayer only comes by the Holy Spirit because we can't pray on our own. I remember that day I prayed, Lord, help me find you. I don't even know how to pray. Lord, I can't even want to find you without you. I can't even work up the desire to pursue you unless you put that desire in me. King David said, make me willing to obey you. 
We, you, see, you see how fragile we are? You see how dependent we are? You see how desperate we are that we can't even desire him without him? Yet there I was in my room, and I reached for the melancholy emotions. Lord Jesus, and tears were flowing. Oh, there was real emotion at work. But power is not found in noise. Power is not found in volume. But I gave it all I had. And one hour went by of me praying with those emotions. Praying with that intent. Praying, Lord Jesus, please, Lord God, please. And I was begging even though, and I was, I was praying as a beggar though I was a son. After about an hour of this, I realized it wasn't going to work that way. And I remember one hour passed and nothing happened. And I said, you know what? I'm going to get real spiritual now. And I reached for my aggressive emotions. You know, where you're declaring, you're decreeing, you're speaking against, you're coming against, you're interceding, you're visualizing demonic powers and telling them to go. I gave all the aggression that I had to give. I rebuked, I decreed, I declared, I established dominion. Everything I had was in that prayer. Another hour passed, and guess what? Nothing happened. I was getting frustrated. But I was exhausted of my frustration after that hour. What else was there to reach for? The third hour, I thought, you know what? I'll think this through. I'll analyze. I'll assess. I'll process. I'll try to see where God's moving. But it's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And I tried to process. I tried to assess. You know, I'm very analytical. And at the time, I was very, very proud of my ability to assess and analyze. I had confidence in my intellect. After all, I memorized many scriptures by it. The scripture says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And yeah, the letter killed me. I exhausted myself depending upon my intellect while praying. The third hour passed, and guess what? Nothing happened. Fourth hour I was now on. And I reached for the familiar. I reached for rituals. I reached for what I knew had worked in the past. And I was reminded of that scripture that says, the children of Israel knew God's actions, but Moses knew God's way. I reached for the actions when I did not know the nature. And I treated God as if he was automatic. I treated God as if he was a vending machine. That if I put in a definite amount of something, I can receive a definite amount of something. But God is not mechanical. He's personal. He does not respond to ritual. He responds to the genuine cries of the heart. He responds to genuine spirit cries. He responds to genuine pursuit of his presence. And so I turned on the worship music. I opened my Bible. I began quoting scriptures. There's power in the word. There's power in the truth of the word, not necessarily in the phonetic pronunciation. And I start quoting. And I start declaring again. And I start worshiping. I had the music on. I, I, I turned on my ceiling fan because it was getting hot in the room. My light was on. My mind was racing. And I pursued him in every way that I could with ritual. And guess what? Nothing happened. I was going into my fifth hour. And I said, Lord, I give up. But I didn't give up in the way you might think. That's when I prayed. I don't know how to pray, Lord. Teach me to pray. I said, 
I, I don't know how to find you. I was so desperate. I was crying when I said this. I said, Lord, I don't know how to find you. Help me find you. And a very gentle, a very gentle voice gave a very polite instruction. He said, turn off the fan, turn off the light, close your Bible, and turn off the music. And I did. The room was quiet, but my mind was not. I was still racing inside. And I was reminded of that scripture in that moment, be still and know that I am God. You can't know him until you're still. David said, in quietness do you lead me. The scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So there I was, my mind racing. I said, Lord, how do I quiet my mind? And again, that polite, still, small voice spoke, just look at me. And I don't know how, but I knew what that meant. I think it was because it was spirit communicating with spirit. And when he said, just look at me, I knew he was talking about the eyes of my heart. And the eyes of my heart turned from inward, from my situation, my problems, and I looked to Jesus. I imagined what would it be to look at his eyes? What would it be to have his hand? What would I feel if he put his hand on my shoulder? And there, as only the Holy Spirit can do, he began to manifest the presence of the Son right there in my room. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He intensifies the reality of Christ. He did it in Genesis. He did it in the beginning of Matthew when, with the Immaculate Conception when, he, when Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the incarnate. He's the one who incarnates God. And so there he was, fleshing together the Son of God before my eyes, and I'm talking about the eyes of my heart. And I remember I was so still, I, th th his presence became so intense, so real, so vivid, that I thought if I were to move my hand in front of me, I might feel it brush against his robe. Call it childlike faith, but I thought that if I, in that moment, were to open my eyes, I would see Jesus standing right there before me. That's how real he became. And that's when I felt that power. I begin to shake. I begin to tremble. I begin to stand in awe. And I didn't want to move. I said, don't move, don't move, don't move. You, you don't disturb it. Don't say anything. Don't think anything. Just... Enjoy it. This experience was transforming me as I stood there because the power of God can touch your life and work a miracle, but only the presence can transform your heart. And so I was there being transformed in the image. I thought of that scripture where it says you're transformed in the image of the Son as you behold Him. As He was a reality to me, I was becoming like Him, just being near Him. Remember, the Pharisees knew that the disciples had been with Jesus just by their demeanor. I was being with Jesus and I was being transformed right there. No effort. Church, I even forgot that I was trying to pray. I forgot about prayer. I forgot about myself. I forgot about my inadequacy because Jesus was so real. And this moment lasted for minutes, but I tell you this honestly with all sincerity, and I've checked my heart before I've spoken this, it lasted for minutes, but it would have been worth it if I waited a hundred years. You give water to a man in the dry and arid desert. You give water to a man who's standing under the harshness of the unforgiving heat of the sun. And he drinks that refreshing. That becomes life. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He takes the infinite, because when you think about God, it's not that the concepts are hard to grasp. We understand love. We understand forgiveness. We understand holiness. The principles themselves about God are not what make Him incomprehensible. 
What makes God incomprehensible is the infinite nature of his person. So we know love, but we cannot comprehend infinite love. We know mercy, but we cannot comprehend infinite mercy. In this regard, it's possible to know the Father without fully comprehending Him. But what the Holy Spirit does is He manifests the Father as the Son, and the Son is the relatable one whom we see. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Really? They're all portraits of God. I used to think that God was the mean one, Jesus was the nice one, and the Holy Spirit was the mysterious one. They're different, yes, but they're also one and the same. If we got into quantum mechanics, we could possibly explain this. I mean, quantum mechanics, it makes room for the Trinity, but I still don't get it. However, the Trinity works together. They're united. That's why they're talked about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 because it's an example to the church about unity in the gifts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all work together to deposit a gift in someone's life. But God is the image. The Holy Spirit is the painter. Jesus is the painting. You are the canvas. The Holy Spirit takes Father God, manifests Him as comprehensible Son, and molds you into the image as you experience that reality. There is no one more passionate about Jesus than the Holy Spirit. There is no one more familiar with Jesus than the Holy Spirit. And they promote one another. And this infinite God is painted on the canvas of your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10, the scripture says this, but it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given to us. And then the scripture goes on to explain that no eye has seen, or, or, or just above explains no eye has seen, no ears heard. But the Holy Spirit reveals these things to us. Now, I don't have time to get into the teaching on body, soul, and spirit. But I'm sure here at this church, you guys are very familiar with body, soul, and spirit. Okay. God works in threes. Time, matter, space, solid, liquid, gas, past, present, future, three dimensions, Body, soul, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We can go on and on and on. Jesus is manifested to us in the physical realm. He's the power we feel. He's the healing on the body. He's the deliverance. Because Jesus is the manifested expression of God. God the Father is the everywhere presence of God, everywhere at all times, and we experience God the Father through awareness. But the Holy Spirit is the indwelling presence of God. Not only does He reside in you, He resides deep within the Father, and He searches all the deep things of God, and He communicates them to your spirit. Now, the language in heaven is not English, it's not Spanish. I can go on listing languages that it's not. I would be here for hours listing languages. The language of heaven is spirit. We speak spirit. The depths of your heart communicate with the depths of God. 
And that is where oneness takes place. And the Holy Spirit reveals these things. In fact, the Scripture talks about Him revealing secrets. The Holy Spirit is the keeper of God's secrets. He's the one who knew about Jesus coming in the flesh, and he kind of hinted at it all throughout the Old Testament. And the prophets kind of knew, but they didn't quite get it. And then Paul talks about how glorious it is that we get to know what he had in his mind all this time. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us those secrets. An infinite God cannot be completely explained in a finite book. Don't stone me just yet. This book is complete. This book is the foundation. This book is infallible. This book is the introduction. When talking about the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to me, cessationists always ask me. They go, Brother David, is not the word of God enough? Is this not sufficient? And they say it's so robust, you know. It almost intimidates me. But I say, you know, the purpose of this book was to connect us with God, was to put us in relationship with the Father. If I can't talk to him and he can't talk to me, then this book is insufficient. And I turn it right back on them. Is this book not sufficient? Of course it is. But it's not everything there is to know about God. The Holy Spirit keeps these things, these secrets. I'm not claiming any new revelation that violates the principles. In fact, the revelation that the Holy Spirit shares with us is foundational. The foundation is on this word. The fundamentals are found in this word, and we build on this. But the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, has a still, small voice. Do you know why? It's because secrets are not shouted, they're whispered. Secrets are not shouted, they're whispered. This baptism that you experience, this fullness that's outside of salvation. Now remember, God did not deposit partiality. You cannot divide eternity into parts. If I cut something that's infinite in half, both halves are infinite. Infinity minus 100 is infinity. So God can't take a little bit of the Holy Spirit and put him inside of you. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the fullness of God inside of you. And he comes and he knows everything there is to know. That's why I don't, I don't consider new converts as liabilities. People say, oh, don't let them read Revelation. And, and then we, in some churches they do this. They say, oh, don't teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. Don't teach on speaking in tongues yet. Don't speak on the gifts yet. We want to save that as they mature. I'm like, that's, that's backwards. They're not going to mature until they receive that baptism. But when we receive that, it's still a separate experience in that we receive him at salvation, we release him at baptism. He goes from within to without at baptism and he takes over. That's why it can manifest in speaking in tongues. That's why it manifests in the gifts. That's why it manifests in the fruits because the fruits of the spirit come through the soul and through the body in our character, in our actions, in our personality, in our decisions. So this Holy Spirit who's deposited to us has this experience waiting for us. But how do you experience it? How do you connect with that? You have to be still. You have to be quiet. You have to hear that still, small voice. Let him guide you in prayer. Let him guide you in worship. Let him guide you in the baptism experience. Quiet. I've visited churches all across the world. And probably the greatest misconception, I should say one of the greatest misconceptions about the Holy Spirit is that he's loud and boisterous. Can I just say something? The Holy Spirit doesn't make you senseless. He makes you sharp. We're, we've become so aloof to God. I understand closeness with him. 
Oh, but, but some, some refer to him as their buddy, their pal. And they're very aloof in their approach. Yes, he's my father, but he's also a holy God. And the Holy Spirit is so eloquent and so classy and so gentle. Yes, you can respond with excitement. Yes, the fire will make you react and speak in tongues. That's okay. Raise your voice. But remember that to experience him, to connect with him, there has to be that stillness that takes place. If you'll remember, last time I was here, and I'll close with this thought. The last time I was here, I shared on John chapter 6. Do you remember the different steps that Jesus went through? Incarnation. Crucifixion. Resurrection. Okay, remember, remember all that? Okay. I won't go through the whole thing. But the transfiguration of Christ, remember the scripture says, now the Lord is spirit. And Jesus became the life-giving spirit. I really marvel at, at, at technology. And when I say that, I'm not just using that word as we often do. I mean, in, in, in America, we, we abuse words. You know, we can say a sandwich is awesome. So when something awesome, something that inspires awe in you happens, you don't really have a word for it anymore. Because you wasted it on a sandwich. <laughs> but I really do marvel at technology. I marvel at it. I, I'm just so amazed. And you know, I can, I can, I can take photos on this iPad. I, I, I usually do it on my phone. I, 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 I load my sermons on here. I load video. And there's this thing on here that's called the cloud. How many are familiar with the cloud? Some people think it's the government trying to take over. I'm not... I'm not too nervous about it. But the cloud, what it does is I upload my information. If I'm not connected to the internet, I only have the information on my iPad. I only have it on one device. But when I connect to the internet, my iPad connects to the cloud. And it starts to take all of the information, all of my files, everything that's on here, and backs it up. And what that means is, I can access that cloud from anywhere in the world from any other device. When Jesus was transfigured, something happened. You know, I believe that the, the, the closer we get to improve knowledge and improve technology, that, as a, as a, a, the, that humankind can better understand the workings of God. Why? Because he is logic. I don't, I'm not afraid of science. There is no contradiction between science and the Bible. And as we move through our understanding in physics and science and technology, we come to grasp concepts that better explain our understanding of God. And this idea of the cloud, I couldn't help but correlate it when Jesus ascended on the clouds. The Holy Spirit is Jesus uploaded on the cloud. And you can access him. See, that's why he said, remember he said this. He said, I have to go so I can be with you. He says, I must go, but I'll be with you. I have to leave, but I'll be here. And the Bible says that he was working with them, confirming their word with signs following. The Lord was. I have to go in order to come. I have to leave. Why? He had to leave to be transfigured so that he can come back through the Holy Spirit. I must go so that we can send the comforter. If Jesus didn't go, the information wouldn't be there to come back. When Jesus ascended on that cloud, he was uploaded to heaven's system. And now you can access him from anywhere in the world at any point through any means. Prayer is not an upload, it's a download. I'll continue this next time I'm here. Can we just lift our hands and pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth and we thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is so real in this moment. And Father, I pray that this teaching would begin to stir hearts 
to begin to pursue all that you have for us, that you, you would teach us to begin to pursue you in the way you desire to be sought. Teach us to pray. Teach us to worship. Teach us to find you. Teach us to move into those deep places. Lord, teach us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's anybody in here who's yet to receive that experience where the Holy Spirit is released from within and changes things without, let them experience it today. Lift your hands all across this room. Stand on your feet, will you? If you're in this place and you say, I want to experience the greater depths of God. I want to experience the fullness of what the Holy Spirit is offering to me. Then I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to think about it. I want you to get out of your seat and come stand at this altar and say, Lord, I'm not leaving until you touch me.